of business, what can be more deftly done? There's a topic towards the end of the day that uh, it's not dull, because it really resonates with what Andy, Malvina, and Joe have said. Uh, I've spent 30 years working in leadership roles, but mostly as a consultant, helping organisations figure out that actually most organisations are unkind by design, and are constantly perpetrating small acts of violence and inhumanity on people that work in organisations. So when I talk about kind of business, I don't mean business in that whole sense of every organisation has to be like a business. It's how we get work done, how we get stuff done. Public sector, private sector, voluntary sector. So, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my experience of 30 odd years <laughs> um, and, and, and really try and give you three, three words to take away that might help you, at the very least, challenge and influence the environment you're in where you don't work. Uh, but also, if you're in a position of leadership uh, now or in the future, uh, to be able to influence your organisations to be better places that do work and places that do better work. That's kind of what I've spent the last 30 years learning how to do. So at the moment, I've uh, just started a new role work at King's Fund, um, which is a charitable foundation that uh, works in the health and care sector. Uh, because it's a charitable foundation, it's outside the bureaucracy and political wins that, that are in the health and care system and, and the King's Fund is really well respected, quite influential as a think tank and I'm um, looking at doing leadership and organisational development work. So helping health and care organisations tackle health inequalities and try and uh, improve the way that health and care is delivered. So it's it's great work and great fun. Uh, I feel very, very privileged. Uh, there's that word again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and guess you know, guess how I ended up doing this work. You know, we saw how that played out in the game. Um, so, you know, I recognise that, that I'm in a, in a very privileged position to be able to do this kind of work. So, so really, the story goes back to my first job. I did an engineering degree, worked in manufacturing, and, and I kind of felt, oh, you know, this is great work and I'm really enjoying it, but why, why aren't engineering companies run by engineers in the UK? Because if you go to Germany and Japan, where they're really good at manufacturing, you find that those companies are run by engineers. Uh, who, who are engineering companies run by in the UK? What do you think? What type of thing? Old Etonians. Old, yeah, old <laughs> white middle class, heterosexual men. What, what are they qualified in? What did they learn at school? So they're like the, the, the big, big commerce and management. Yeah, so it's management yeah. stuff, and primarily they're finance people and accountants. So and management specialists. And what, what we have, you'll, you'll recognise this in, in most organisations of any scale that you encounter, and this is exactly why what, what you articulated might be that the services are not person-shaped, they're organisation-shaped, that's why they fail. It's because they're designed as top-down management control systems that are focused on the numbers, not on what really matters. And there's a huge paradox here. I've learned this over the years, and people think you're absolutely crazy when you say this, or they did 30 years ago. But if you design to do what really matters, which you can only find out by listening to people in Chapel Town, not in Whitehall, then you end up designing services that work better, the staff enjoy what they do more, it's cheaper, and you make more money if you're in the business of making money. Okay? So, Marvin and I will connect after this. Yes. We need to talk about what the King's Fund can do to connect to Forum Central. Um, so, I've seen this same pattern repeat again and again. Public sector organisations, private sector organisations. They're generally run as top down, functional, mechanistic hierarchies where managers manage to produce numbers and workers do as instructed by management. So, here's what we've learned. Kindness is effectively 
designed out of us organisations. So um, we, we heard earlier you know, about the agricultural systems being designed that way, that really resonated. That's exactly what I've learned. <laughs> we have unkind organisations by design. So guess what? You can design organisations that are kind and have kindness, compassion, inclusivity designed in. You've got to learn how to do it. And the good news is, one step at a time, one person at a time, one team at a time, one problem at a time. Just start. We've got a, a mate who works up in um, Gateshead, he's the Director of Transformation in the Council there. Uh, and he, he's full of wonderful quotes. One of, his, one of the things I heard him say once when he was asked, you know, but this is great, Mark, where do you start? He said, just start anywhere and then go everywhere. Just start anywhere. Start with what's in front of you. Start with where the energy is. Okay? So, my book. Uh, <coughs> I used to be an engineer, wondered why engineers weren't in charge of engineering companies. Got married, went travelling, came back, thought, how am I going to get back into the job market? I know I'll go and do a master's degree and learn how to be a manager. And what did I learn? I learned the conventional wisdom. Managers manage, workers work. Managed by the numbers. Human beings are resources, human resources. Who ever thought that was a good idea? To call a department in an organisation human resources. Just think about what those two words tell us about how managers think. So, fortunately, on the margins of my MBA programme, there's a really interesting bunch of people who were systems thinkers. And Martina today is talking about influencing system leaders. That's now becoming a common phrase, common currency. Government are introducing legislation to introduce these great care systems. 20 years ago, people thought you were crazy if you talked about organisations as systems. Now it's catching on. We'll talk about systems leaders and how to influence them. Okay? So this is a book by an American psychologist called Alfie Cope. Completely changed the way I thought about the world. Because what he taught me when I read this book, thank God for books, <laughs> was that human beings flourish when you put them in environments where you don't manage them and you don't control what they do and you don't limit their tasks to small portions of an end to end process. What you do is work with people on collaboration on content, in other words, their job is interesting and they can see things end to end, and choice and control. Three things. It made perfect sense then and explained why I felt weird about the rest of the content that I was being taught on my management course. I think this is about my third copy now. I keep wearing them out and giving them to people. What's it called, Jeremy? It's called Punished by Rewards. The trouble with gold stars, incentive plans, A's, praise, appraisals, and other bribes. Think about it. What happens to our kids at school? They have star charts, and cones, and grades. At work, we have appraisals, and performance ratings, and rewards. All of these things destroy motivation and are unkind by design. So how do we design kindness into our organisations? Public sector, private sector, voluntary sector. I mean, there's loads of stuff. I've been doing this for 30 years. You know, I could talk all day. <laughs> but one, one little thing to catch on to is three C's. How do we design the way that we do work in our organisation to create collaboration? Don't ask people to work on their own. Get people to problem solve and think and make sense together. Shared sense making. Let's get around this problem in Chapel Town with the people who are experiencing the problem at the time that they're experiencing it and go figure out what happens here, what's happening. Listen to people, what really matters. Collaboration, content, loads and loads of research that says. Human beings flourish when they have interesting things to do. And that, you know, I mean, this is a statement of bleeding obvious, isn't it? But our organisations aren't designed this way. 
This, this, this stuff was invented by Frederick Winslow Taylor and Henry Ford 100 years ago. It works when all you're trying to do is manufacture millions of black model T4 motorcars. It doesn't work in complex environments where you're trying to provide services for people with different needs and complex needs and need maybe to be supported by a number of different organisations. So, <clears throat> collaboration, content. People need to be able to work end to end and see things through from the beginning to the end. Anyone had an experience of phoning up a bank or a <laughs> utility company or engaging with health and social care system where you get assessment, referral, delay, cue? Nothing's end to end. Those jobs are unkind by design for the people that do those jobs because they can't solve people's problems. They can only do what they do. They're also unkind to the people that we're trying to help. It destroys relationships and collaboration and contact. And finally, choice, control. What happens when you tell people what to do? They get defensive. They'll don't tell you what to do. <laughs> they don't want to do it. And anyone heard of the whiteboard studies? Really, really interesting piece of research that was done, I think, back in the 70s about what caused stress and ill health at work. The hypothesis was, the further up the food chain you were in the organisation, the more stressful it would be. What they found was completely the opposite. The further down you are in an organisational hierarchy, the worse your health outcomes. And the main driver of that is lack of control. We need to deprive human beings of control in their work. It makes them ill. Physically, mentally, it's damaging and it's a form of violence against other human beings. So I think there's a moral imperative to change the way we think about the design and management of working organisations. And that's what I do. Uh, you know, you know some, sometimes I have to turn up to work, you know, dressed up like a consultant, wearing a suit and a pink shirt and all that stuff. <laughs> Because those are the clients you're dealing with, and at other times I can turn up dressed a bit different, and you know, it's going to try and hit the middle ground because you never know. Um, <laughs> but you know, all of these weird identities that we try and take on are all about what I'm trying to do, which is to help people think and act systemically, create better places to do work, and get better work done as a consequence. So you can improve service, efficiency, revenue. Role. All at the same time, I'm thinking about things like those three C's. Kindness by design. Unkindness by design. These things do not happen by accident.